Run it up, then run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Run it up. Good Wednesday morning. Welcome to Run It Back here on FanDuel TV. Three hats and no hat. I mean, Shams. Shams, you ever wear a ball cap? Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen Shams. Never, it, never in my life would I wear Ever? No Do you chance. own some? The hair is too small. No chance. Uh, this is what about, I, I what about a beanie, I, Shams? What about a beanie? beanie I just donate them. I just donate them. And even like hats in the wintertime, I'm never going to be in a hat. I'll be wearing those like little mufflers, ear mufflers. That's about all I've, I have. Well, well, well. <laughs> Look at us learning this morning. We can do another hour on the things Shams won't wear. I'm excited about this. <laughs> okay, but we can't uh, because we have basketball. And we have some news as well. But let's start with the Clippers Timberwolves game last night. This was the late game. Uh, Kawhi, unfortunately, out of this one early. Timberwolves do storm back, though. They win 118-100. Edwards, 37-8-4. Conley had his 23 points. But it was Kawhi, the story of the night, who leaves in the third or first quarter. I'm sorry. Uh, Shams, this is just one of those moments where you're like, no, 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 not again. Please don't be. But he left first quarter. What's the latest on Kawhi Leonard? Yeah, there was a drive that Kawhi Leonard made in that first quarter. He, he made the bucket, but you could tell when he landed, he, he, he grimaced, uh, went and tugged at his back a little bit. He left the game with back spasms. He was walking gingerly uh, post-game as he was exiting the arena. He's been dealing with, with it for at least the last few days. He was so uncomfortable, the Clippers said he, instead of sitting on the bench, decided it was best for him to go home. And there's obvious concern when it comes to back spasms. It really just depends on how your back reacts to treatment over the, over the coming days. Um, I mean, Chandler Liu can probably speak to back spasms more than I can as, as dealing with it as professional athletes. But the, the hope for the Clippers is that you, you mitigate it and it just kind of goes away. But with back spasms, you just don't know. And the Clippers are about to embark on a, on a little bit of a long road trip when it comes to travel. They're going from L.A. to Chicago today, and then they mm -hmm. play the Pelicans on Friday. So Bulls Thursday, Pelicans in New Orleans on Friday. That's a tough back to back for them, especially with the travel. Does Kawhi Leonard even make the trip given that he couldn't even sit on the bench because of how, how uncomfortable he was with that back? But, uh, you know, th these things can be uncomfortable and it just depends on timing and treatment as far as when he could be back on the floor. Oh, and they're sitting there in that four spot. Chandler, you up first. The, the reaction to this news and it being a back issue, which seems to be something you can never predict. Yeah, like you just you, you said that, that they're so unpredictable where the back spasms, they come and they go and there's different, you know, treatments you can do. There's massage, there's hot tubs, there's there's different, you know, ways to kind of treat these, but they're so unpredictable and they come and go. You never know when they're happening. So kind of for them to fully settle you, you kind of just have to sit out for a while which obviously this time of the year is the most important time of the year uh for guys to be getting healthy and powering up for this last stretch going into the postseason so uh, it's tough because like, like we've talked about it's you don't know when they're coming you don't there's not there's just like a cure there's not even really a timetable for back spasms because they're so unpredictable so this is tough it's awful timing clearly he's in a lot of pain um, and this kind of this this bothers you every single movement you make. It's not like something you can really play through. It affects your you know your lateral movement, your jumping, your your offense. It, it, it kind of affects everything. So it's definitely not good. The flip side, the Clippers are a very deep team. So this is the luxury, not like a you know a Boston and a Denver. If if you know, they lose a key player. They don't have much to kind of sub in there, and it's not easy just to, re you're, to replace Kawhi Leonard. But hopefully right. these just kind of chill out, settle down, and he can get back in the lineup quick and not miss too much time. Yeah, and I listen, I can, and I can attest to it. You know, I played basketball for the first time in about six months. I'm dealing with oh, back no. spasms right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, dealing with, I'm dealing with back spasms right now. Extremely uncomfortable, um, especially when you're playing at the pro level and you're Kawhi Leonard and you're trying to win an NBA championship. A completely different standard than what I'm dealing with. And I'm telling you right now, I'm having a hard time walking around, even laying in my bed, just trying to find some, some comfort, you know? And so I, I, I sympathize with Kawhi, and this is going to be a major impact on the Clippers, man. Um, I thought once they made this trade for, for James Harden, Paul George came out of it as the best player that was going to benefit the most from it. As time went on, 
it was clear that it was going to be Kawhi Leonard, and he was the best player. And this is going to be very impactful. When you talk about the Clippers, they're best when they're whole. And for this guy to go out, it's going to be interesting to see what Paul George and James Harden can do with, along with the rest of the cast of guys, you know. And so not just even on the offensive end, defensively, Kawhi Leonard is going to be their anchor along with, you know, sending guys to the seven-footer Zubak back there. So, you know, this is going to be impactful. It'll be interesting to see how long he sits out. And I'll tell you yeah. this, a flight to yeah. Chicago is not going to help it. You know, you can do all the ice, Long. the stem. That stuff is even more aggravating, and that's going to keep prolonging it if he's traveling, if he's going in and out of film sessions to practice. I'm assuming he's going to get shut down for some time until he's fully healed to get healthy when it matters. I mean, if sitting hurts, I yeah, sitting on a flight isn't going to be better. Even laying down, I, I don't know what you're supposed to do about it, but we have to talk now about Paul George and James Harden. This, unfortunately, was the news I think Clippers fans maybe subconsciously thought one of them would get hurt, um, but hoped that it wouldn't happen. So let's talk about Harden here. Can we get some vintage Harden out of this, Chandler? Man, I hope so. I hope so. It's going to have to be more than 17 points, five rebounds, eight assists. He's going to have to go straight up Houston, James Harden, and this is why they did that. All these guys, you know what you're going to get from Paul George, right? He's going to be pretty solid. If he's healthy, he's going to produce. James Harden's kind of been hit or miss, hot and cold this season. So I'd love to see him get back in his bag, continue to be passive and get these other guys involved around him. But it's now time. We don't know how much time Kawhi is going to miss, but they have enough talent between him, between Norman Powell, Paul George. They, they have enough talent to pick up the slack. And like I said earlier, you can't just replace Kawhi Leonard. This isn't as bad as like Luka going down for the Mavs. This isn't as bad as like Jokic going down for the Nuggets. You can't just replace Kawhi Leonard, but they do have a collective balanced deep team where they can get contributions from the Coffees and the Bone Highlands of the, of the world that they can kind of chip in. But I would love to see James this, this next game back just kind of be super aggressive, take 25 shots. I'm sure Tyron Liu, I'm sure Paul George, they don't mind those two guys carrying the load while Kawhi Leonard's out. So we're going to find out if he's still got in the tank to carry a team. A tough back-to-back -back ahead of him. We'll keep our eye on that. Uh, on the other side of things, Ant dominated this one 37 points, but it's the sound we want to get to. Here he is after the game telling us why the Clippers couldn't hold him back. What a game this was. You exploded in that third quarter. What were you seeing out there? Um, just a bunch of mismatches. Yeah, pretty much. Care to elaborate? Um, I mean, you know, their best defender is Kawhi. Kawhi went down, and, you know, they was just putting two on me and trying stuff. So, and I, I hit one shot, and I just got going. <laughs> hey, Lou, you first. Uh, seems honest. <laughs> Very honest. I'm, listen, I'm going to tell you all the truth. He's from Atlanta. He's from Atlanta. He's, uh, I speak the language. I understand undertones. When he, see, when he has a big smile on his face and he's saying a bunch of mismatches, can none of y'all guard me? That was his professional <laughs> way of saying, y'all can't do nothing with me and y'all never will be able to do nothing with me. Ant-Man is special. He's coming, he's coming into his own for whatever, for whatever reason. He got a bone to pick with the Clippers. Every time they play, he's either calling somebody old or he's going at their heads or he's saying that, that it's a mismatch everywhere he goes. He has a thing for the Clippers. So this is getting interesting for me. This is going to be one of those matchups I like to see at the end of the road in the Western Conference to see what's really going on. Yeah, I I mean, everything every day I don't think I can like this guy anymore that he says some stuff like that. I'm just it's it's hilarious. And there was a couple of plays last night too where he's just clamping Paul George on an ISO, get a deflection, get a steal, gets in a passing lane, gets out in transition. It's just so much fun and, and on the break. Just, his ISO game is insane. And like Lou said, this he even said after the game to himself said this is a statement game he realized that they may have to go through this team in the playoffs i don't care that carl anthony towns is down i'm the guy none of you can guard me double team me triple team whatever i'm still gonna get 37 on your head and Kawhi leonard did go out but Nas reed rolled his ankle rudy gobert got hurt late in the game too their second best player is out so they're banged up just as much as the clippers are banged up and anthony edwards took this on himself to go and dominate and make sure his team got this win and he got a huge contribution from alexander walker mike conley found his offensive game last night i think he had five threes so they did get some some balanced attack from other guys but anthony edwards had something to prove and he said himself this was a statement game and he said they want to win out. This isn't a team where they're just going to lollygag. They're trying to, you know, pick their matchups. They want to win every single game and get that number one seed. In games like this, it's hard not to think they're going to do it. 
Uh, we'll stay with Anthony Edwards for a second because last week he was he missed the tip off because he uh, lost track of time. And last night, checking in for the game late in the second half, uh, fans online are calling him Paul Pierce, basically. <laughs> How does this happen? Although, again, we have theories from last week as well. Could be the same thing. Lou, what happens between... Yeah, Chandler, for halftime, what happens that you are late getting out there? Besides, you know, potty. You're la- you're, you go to the bathroom if you have to. You're laying there. You kind of coach comes in, talks from 20 seconds to two minutes, kind of stretching, foam rolling, and you get back out there with, you know, four or five, six <laughs> minutes on the clock, and you shoot. But, yeah, I think it's time for his agent to kind of get an endorsement deal here with Pepto or the Modium because clearly he's got a real stomach issue for this to be happening twice. There's nothing else this could be. Like we talked about earlier, he's got us, he's got his trainer, he's got his security guard, whatever it is that's with him. He sees the clock in every room in the locker room, uh, you know, mm. back in the locker room. So it's to me, I don't Lou, I don't know, unless there's something else, this is just the stomach issue where he needs to figure it out. His ass gotta take a poop. That's it. That's the <laughs> that's the gist of it. There, there mean, are literally people who get paid to make sure you're where you're supposed to be. Every single player has a small staff of people who are responsible for getting them prepared for games from the top to the bottom. Even, at, even post-game, you have a training session where you're going to get stretched or you're going to get extra shots or you're going to hit the weight room. You st- until you leave that building, there is at least two or three people responsible for you until you leave the arena. So there's no such thing as losing track of time. Absolutely no such thing. Yeah. This is a bathroom issue. I don't know what my man eating. Obviously, he eating good, and he, he got a lot of fiber in there. He got to get it out of there. So, so maybe he should start doubling down before games, man. I don't know. I, it's, not like he's in, it's not like he's on the phone. It's not like he's doing something. It's not like no. he needs. It's clearly, it's just, uh, you know, it's a bathroom issue. It's a poorly bathroom. timed. Celebrities are just like us. I, I, I will a say, Lou, I don't know, when I first started playing, like, you know, the clock would start, we'd get out there like nine, eight minutes. By the last year I played, people are running out there with a minute on the clock, taking one shot, stretching, and start the second oh, half. Yeah. So the, the halftime warm-up has gotten shorter and shorter. Fair. That's fair. All right, oh, yeah. we... Uh, you mentioned it a little bit, Chandler, that Rudy Gobert went down with an injury in this one. Um, God, I hate this time of year sometimes. Shams, what's the latest on Gobert? Yeah, Rudy Gobert got x-rays on his ribs. I mean, you could tell he tugged at it. Anytime he, he has that in, in you know, post-game, apparently he was having trouble breathing, uh, walking. But I'm told x-rays were negative, so the hope is that it's just a contusion, just a bruise of the rib area. But that that's still going to be painful, something that he's going to have to deal with, even if it is just bruised ribs. Sometimes I wish you could just start the playoffs in October. Uh, let's move on. Pacers, Thunder. This is a good one. Turner Halliburton, big lead for the Thunder over 121-111. Miles Turner at 24-4-4 and four blocks. Halliburton with 18-12-4. and four. Holmgren, 15-13. And SGA with 30-10-5. and five. Back-to-back impressive wins for this Indiana team right now. They're over the Magic, over OKC. They're one and a half back of the Knicks. For fourth place in the East. And as we go down this final stretch, do they have enough, Chandler, oh. to shock some people in the East? Oh, which is okay. Sorry about that. Uh, those <laughs> are some great highlights. Um, I know. What are you drinking, Lou? Oh, don't ask. Just... OJ, brother, you know the vibes. You've been in the studio with me. You know what I got. Uh, <laughs> um, listen, again, I, we've talked about this all season long. The Pacers, the way they play, the way they get up and down, the way they shoot threes, they're going to create mismatches. They're going to be a tough matchup for whoever they draw in the playoff. Are they a contending team? Are they going to beat the you know, the, the Bucks or the Celtics in the series? I doubt it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they advanced. I wouldn't be surprised if they caught New York and, and even snuck home court advantage here. So uh, I think losing Benedict Matherin, this is a team that needs all hands on deck. They have to be fully healthy. They have to be clicking on all cylinders to have a chance. But they are one of those teams with the style that they play. Not a lot of teams are comfortable doing that. And even when the playoffs, when it does slow down, they have a stud point guard, Hal Burton, that can play pick and roll, that can pick defenses apart, whether it's in transition or in the half court. So I think they're they're going to finish strong here. I think they'll win a lot of games and put themselves in a position. But it's all going to be about who they get matched up with because – 
if it's not the Bucks or if it's not the Celtics, I do think they have enough to advance the, past the first round. Yeah, I think they got enough to pass the first round. I don't, I don't know if they're a championship contender coming out of the, coming out of the East. You know, it's just when it comes down to matchups, I think this team is still still very young, still turning the corner. Got a lot of talent. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, they're gonna from from the young guys, uh, Nate Smith, Nimbard. They're gonna give them looks. You know, we don't talk about Miles Turner enough with the the Siakam and Halliburton combination. You know, they got a lot of good pieces, but when you talk about the uh, the Boston's of the world. When you talk about the Knicks, talk about Cleveland, um, and, and obviously you're going to talk about Milwaukee as well. I, I don't really see them going through those levels of teams to get out of the uh, to get out of the conference. And so I think they're I think they're built for the future, not right now. Built for the future. All right, another team that's been building for the future. Thunder, 26 and seven overall at home. Believe it or not, this was their first home loss since January 29th. They are a young team, Chandler. I would imagine home court advantage is lovely for everyone, but is it more important for a team this young with basically no experience in the playoffs? 1,000%. And they're going to get home court advantage, and they've, pro they've proved how good they are at home. And the playoffs, coaches would always tell us, it's a different monster, it's a different game, the intensity of the atmosphere, and that's true. I remember my first playoff series was actually at Oklahoma City when I was Houston with the, you know, Russ and KD. It's, I was nervous as hell. It's completely different. It is physical. Every play matters. Guys aren't taking plays off. Coaches are more intense during time. Everything just intensifies in the playoffs. And when you're looking at a team right now, they are extremely young. They have minimum to none, uh, you know, playoff experience. And it's huge for them to have that home court, to be more comfortable, to not have to go on the road, you know, to uh, you know, whoever's going to face, you know, Philly, Indiana, whoever, a team like that. So, I, I mean, on the West Coast, probably the Dallas or even the Lakers, whoever it's going to be. But it, it's it's really important because for the first time, they got to get their feet wet, man. It, it, it is a completely different ball game, and I think that their talent will overcome that and they'll settle in. But it's 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 going to be a, a shock to them at first. Just the, the the atmosphere is completely different, and it's so much fun going to be a blast shams we got to get some scoops from you oh man so saturday night was the shangun injury he went down that was a big one um do you have any of the latest news on what's going on with him shangun season is essentially over i'm told he has a grade three ankle sprain that was the official diagnosis from what i'm told he also has a knee bone bruise but that's not as severe that's not going to take as long as the grade three ankle sprain that's going to be several weeks Obviously, there's about four and a half weeks left before the end of the regular season for the Rockets. Thankfully for Sangoon and the Rockets, there's no surgery. There's no major knee injury that he had. It's really just that ankle sprain. But grade three is essentially ligament damage in the ankle. Um, and he's going to have to rehab this injury. Uh, the Rockets are four and a half games out of a playing tournament spot. Mm. Breakout season for Sangoon, though, this year. 63 games overall, 21 points a night, nine rebounds five assists. Obviously, he's broke, broken out as a, as a star player in this league, and when you look into the summertime, he's going to be eligible for a five-year, $225 million max contract. Shoot. He's obviously become the cornerstone of the Rockets. I think he's, it's, when I talk to people on the league, he's put himself in that category as a max caliber player. Dang, yeah, people very aware of his presence these days. Uh, also, 15, play 15 players have scored 50 or more points this season so far. Shams are scoring very high. Teams are, unless they're playing the Knicks. Um, what's the latest on the way people feel about this kind of scoring in the game right now? I'm told the NBA's competition committee, which comprises of league executives, uh, team executives, team officials, team owners, players, the NBA, the NBA Players Union, they all met on Tuesday and they discussed ways to incorporate more defensive freedom, <laughs> uh, evaluating how to potentially allow more physicality, the merits of that, and, and much more. And, and using the next few months in the offseason to strategize how to implement potential you know, changes and, and allowing more defensive freedom into next season. Obviously, we know, like you said, Michelle, this season, 114.9 points per game. That's the most ever since the 1960s. 115.6 offensive rating. That's the most of, of all time. 12.8 three-pointers made per, 
every NBA game. That's the most ever. We know the offensive stats were the highest ever in the All-Star game, almost 400 points scored. Um, so I, I think this is something that the league is discussing, and a lot of it is because players and all these different stakeholders are bringing it up in these calls like the co competition, competition committee call yesterday. Kind of crazy to try to find that balance, guys. I, I don't know what it is, Chandler. Um, I mean, the Knicks are obviously doing something a little bit differently than everyone else, but what do you think? I mean, is there is there something that can be changed? Do we want it to be changed? I think whatever they change it to, whatever the foul call is going to be different. I think players are so talented now these days that they're going to find a way to get around it. You know what I mean, whatever, if they change the hand checking, if they change whatever schemes and, and coverages they change, you know, SGA, Anthony Edwards, these guys are so good offensively. They're going to figure it out. They're still going to play at a high pace. They're still going to shoot 35 foot three pointers. So to me, I think it's a good problem to have. I think it's much more fun seeing these explosive games than watching, you know, the Knicks hold three teams under 80 points and guys shooting a bunch of free throws and, you know, slowing down the game. I think it's a good problem to have, but there does have to be some sort of balance where there's still, you know, pride on the defensive end. And a lot of times that's on the players. They have to, they have, to have that effort. They have to have the energy on the offense, uh, defensive end, just like they do on the offensive end. This is going to be good. All right, Shams, love you, mean it, appreciate it. We say goodbye to you. We say hello to Darius Miles when Run It Back returns. We'll be back. Run it back, yeah. Run it all. The run it back, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. It's the game when I stack it up, I earn my clout. And I just hit the game when I... Number three overall pick to the Clippers back in 2008 years in the league. Darius Miles joins us now. We were just all complaining about how getting old sucks, um, but we don't have to talk about it now. We can talk about happy things, Darius. Uh, your co-host, Quentin Richardson, was was uh, on the show a few months ago. He said that when you were in high school, people started calling you baby KG. I don't know how guys feel about being compared to other dudes, contemporaries, but he, that you could play anything on the court, no worries. Did you like the comparisons? Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, it gave me a little bit of fame. Uh, they started it at Nike camp, uh, you know, Q and all them, they all from Chicago. So uh, I was skinny, tall, dark skin, and they were just like, man, that's baby KG. And the whole camp started calling me. And after that, that's what it was. <laughs> Easy enough. D Miles, when you were in high school, you also, you were invited to Michael Jordan's camp, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's rumors that you guys played one on one. Was there was there any truth to that? No, I didn't play on one on one. Uh, I played against him my first time playing, and uh, you know everybody was kind of scared to guard him. So I, you know, I stepped up to the plate. I was only like going to be a, in tenth grade, so I stepped up to the plate like I guard him, and he just <laughs> like he just he hit every shot he took. But uh, I blocked his shot <laughs> once. I blocked the shot once, but after that game, he switched teams and made me play with him for the rest of the week. And, uh, and that showed that uh, it, it made me confident because it showed that he respected how hard I played and how competitive I was at high school against him. Man, that's, that's awesome. Great. And there's also stories how that is it true that he convinced you to not sign with and one and to sign with, with Nike and Jumpman? Yeah. Uh, we was going to Jordan camp every year since my sophomore year, every summer. And um, after my senior year, we went to Jordan, Santa Barbara Jordan camp again. And we was draped down in and one gear because they sent us so much stuff. And we was trying to get a Nike deal, but Nike was kind of, you know, BS. And so uh, we draped in and one. And when he looked at us, he was like, man, why y'all got that on? And we was like, we can't get a deal. You know, we want to be with Nike. And he was like, all right. So our agent called us that next morning and people knocking on our door and they sent us boxes and boxes of Jordan stuff. And he, my agent was like, what did y'all do? We was like, nothing. And he signed me and Q to Jordan and made Nike pay us. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I love that. That, that, led, that led to you and Q doing uh, the Jordan commercial in, in 2002. You still you yeah. still get the packs? You still get the boxes? Uh, some here and there. Not as many as they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's, your, what's, your favorite, what's your favorite piece that you got back in the day? Oh, the patent leathers. 
You know, that was my favorite one. So uh, Atlanta, any cover, yeah. Any cover, uh, the patent leathers, they were just always, you just felt luxury and, and it just felt like upper class when you had them patent leathers on, whether it was the grays, the black and whites, the uh, black and reds, it's just, you know, it's like they fit yeah. perfect. Cool grays changed the game. You put them cool yeah, grays cool on grays anything. Change. You could hoop yeah. in them, wear them to school, whatever the cool grays yeah. is the was. Fancy. Uh, okay, coming out of high school, I mean, you just mentioned the fact you're playing against MJ in 10th grade. It's just shocking. Um, but you come out of high school, what kind of pressure, if any, did you feel? Or were you so young that maybe that didn't even register yet for you? Uh, it was a lot of pressure because, uh, you know, the team that I got drafted to, it was like a college team. Like, we, every other team was, you know, way older, way more mature. And um, back in that day, uh, a lot of a lot of organizations and a lot of players really wasn't, when fond of guys coming straight out of high school. So, you know, it's like we had to prove ourselves a little bit more because we skipped the process of college like everybody else. And, you know, when you go into a team and guys that been in college or guys that been in the league for a while, they like, man, they ain't finna let this high school guy come in and, you know, take spots. So it was, uh, it was a lot of pressure. Every, every game, you had to prove yourself, you know, to get your peers, to get the respect from your peers. Did you ever even now think if you could do it all over again, would you have changed anything? Would you have gone to college? Had you given that thought? Was there a college you would have gone to? Yeah, you yeah, were so, committed, committed to St. John's, right? Yeah, I committed to St. John's. Uh, before my senior year, uh, I committed to St. John's. Uh, but the coach, uh, Mike Jarvis, you know, great man. You know, he could have been telling me anything, but he was like, man, you're a top five pick, you know. Wow. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go to go to college, but I wouldn't change nothing. Uh, only time I miss college is when, you know, the guys had them college stories about the dorm room and all that other stuff. But outside of that, uh, nah. love the process, love the guys I came yeah. into the league with. Ew. And I would have been a higher say, draft pick. I would have been a higher draft pick after my sophomore and junior year. I stayed all four years. It was so much fun. <laughs> Lou says no. Nah, hell no, D. -Ro hey, D. Miles, we did the right thing. Forget that dorm. We was we was in luxury Ritz Carlton's in Four Seasons. We good. That's true. There was no NIL. We, we were at, we had to get bread under, under the table. It wasn't legal like it is now. But you know, like it it, it didn't really change because with the Clippers, we was working out at Southwest Junior College. That's where our practice facility was. We had to use a gym, so it it really didn't feel like. The league, it feel like halfway the league because Clippers weren't doing stuff like that back then. Yeah, I, listen, when I got drafted by the Sixers, we, we practiced at a, a spot called PCOM. It was like a medical college and we used yeah. the gym. Like we couldn't even come what? in and get extra shots or anything. They like, yo, the gym is booked up wow. for the rest of the day. We when couldn't even take showers. So I, uh, I, we had to go home and take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I understand yeah. that experience. So when you came in, when you came in with the uh with the clips, your first your first game was against Carl Malone and John Stockton, who's obviously yeah. the legendary pick and rollers. How was how was that first game? What what was that experience like? Was you nervous? Man, it, it it was surreal. I didn't know John Stockton was that big. Like like, you know, you see him on TV, he looked like a smaller guy, but he was he was real tall and big, and then Carl Malone arms. So we kind of got into it with him and Olin Polony and all them, and you know we couldn't back down. And I just think back on, I was like, man, he would have kicked my ass if I would have ran up on him because I was sticks and bones. But his arms was so big, and he was so big to get around him. And just the uh, just the size of the game, we was way faster and quicker, but they they knew more than us. And then I, that's when I really really realized that this this game is a whole another level. You got to think it out too. Yeah, D. Miles. During that same time on the Clips, you were playing in the same building as the Shaq and Kobe three-peat team, and I was wondering, especially during those times, was there any beef? Like, was there je jealousy? Was there even more of a rivalry? Like, sharing that 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 same arena? No, nah, uh, we beat them every year. We beat them in the regular season, like once or twice. Uh, Shaq was like a big brother. When we got to L.A., like he. He took us in like 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 we was little bros, you know, invited us to his house, invited us to different events. 
Kobe was younger, so every time we played, Kobe was up for the challenge. And, you know, they, mm. they team was older. So Phil and Kobe used to always want to, like, demolish us. But uh, it really wasn't no beef or no problem or nothing like that. Uh, I think we kind of gra grabbed our fan base from the grassroots and, you know, came on up from that. They liked the way we played and how hard we played. That was the... Uh... The Shaq is a cop phase. Um, always yes. great video and pictures from that era. Uh, is it true he, he pulled, pulled you over? Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> How'd that go? Yeah, he made me late for practice, pulled me over. I guess they didn't have practice. And man, he pulled me over, and the rest was history from there. I told him you got to pay my fine. He said, I got you. And I went on to practice. <laughs> What a fun thing to be able to do to friends. <laughs> Wait, were, did you know it was him immediately, by the way? Like, could you I, tell in your I rear view? I, was, I was looking down. I was looking down in my glove compartment trying to grab all my proper paperwork. <laughs> and, oh and I looked up. I was no, like, man, you, you know he police for real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He act he actually police. He he told me stories about how he'll pull people over or um, go to people's houses and they think they're getting punked or it's a prank because it's Shaq. So they they don't take it serious. But he wow, he, he actually po he a real police officer. That's awesome. Yeah, he, nah, legit, he legit. legit. Go ahead. He, he legit. Nah, I, just, he I wanted to know you play. Nah, he, nah, he real twelve. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I, w I wanted to ask you, man, you play, you only played two seasons with the Clips. Why do you think things ended so early, so quick? Uh, I think it's just the organization, just how they was, how, how they was ran. Uh, I don't, like we had, we had all that talent, but we had enough money to pay two superstars max money. There wasn't nobody on the team making no money or nothing like that. I just think that, that organization really wasn't looking or believed in themselves to be a good organization. Wow. So Darius, after that year, you're traded to Cleveland and that was before LeBron gets there. And that whole year, you're basically tanking to get the number one pick to get LeBron. What was that process like just knowing the ownership is trying to lose games to get this, you know, this next prodigy kid? Uh, I never lost like that ever in my life. Uh, I didn't, didn't understand it completely. Uh, I was going to LeBron games. His games was way more packed than our games. Like, everybody was going to his games. So I was so hoping that we didn't have a game on the day that they had a game because, you know, his games was live. So uh, going to his game this whole senior year, but i never been through that much losing. Like, I think we won 16 games out of 82. I ain't never felt nothing like that. Uh, it was an experience for me. But uh, the next year, the town changed when we got LeBron. Yeah, it's crazy when we think about the, the year before a team becomes great. Forget about what that felt like. At the end of that season, there was a, a local reporter that asked you guys about the possibility of LeBron coming to the Cavs. Carlos Boozard said that the Cavs had better guys on the team. You know we're doing this. You said this. We got the video. Roll it. I don't think you can really just bring a high school player in and really just think your team going to really turn around like that. Baby Darius. All right. Um, it's one of those hot takes gone cold. <laughs> Is it weird to watch that now, knowing how it all played out? No, because uh, they just played clips and they edited it. If you really listen to everything that I said, I was taking up for LeBron. Like, they was trying to put this all this pressure on him. They was trying to do all this other stuff. Like, I was with LeBron like his senior year. I used to go over his house. I used to go to the games and all that stuff. We had a relationship before he came to to the, uh, Cleveland. So uh, if you really look at the whole interview and everything they saying, you know, I'm, I'm a country boy, so I probably use a lot of wording that they might not have understood in a slang type way. But in that statement, if you listen to everything I said, I was taken up for him because I was like, man, y'all ain't finna put pressure on my man like that to, to just turn something around like, and if you know what team we was on, we won 16 out of 82. It wasn't all happy, go lucky around there. Everything wasn't fine and dandy. So, you know, knowing what we went through last year, you're not going to put no pressure on my man to come in and just turn this organization around and we was the worst team in the NBA like that. Like, it's never been done like that before. So, 
you know, when I see that clip, you know, it's it's all love and good. You know, this is that new day and never where they take something and they try to run with it. But in all actuality, I was really taken up for them. Once that season started, though, did you know, like immediately, he was a he was a generational talent, and this was gonna be a this was gonna be a long ride. And did you see him still in 21 years, still being as dominant as he is? No, nah, I didn't see in 21 years that he was gonna have 40,000. Like that's <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, right. <laughs> but I knew he was a generational talent. I knew he was gonna be a good player. I knew he was gonna get, be a good player by watching him in high school. Like just how advanced his game was, and once he you put them on the court, you take them off the court with high school guys and put them on the court with older guys, didn't nothing change. Like, he just looked a, a little bit more faster. He looked like he jumped a little bit more high. Uh, but I knew it from training camp. I knew it from the summertime. We was all working out during the summertime, playing together. Like, he was something special. Uh, and an organization like that, they got him. They didn't really know what to do with him. Like, they had, I started point that year. I started the point, Ricky Davis was the two, LeBron was the three, Boozer was the four, Big Z was the five. And I struggled at point guard because I felt LeBron should have ran point because the way his game was, it was like he played so smoothly and got everybody involved, plus got buckets. But, you know, I just think the organization really off the rip didn't know what they was doing. Though. He probably would have made the playoffs every year if if they was prepared for him. You had like a Don Nelson or something that make you run up and down the court, you know what I'm saying? Run like we really wanted to run a team. We was running like the Utah Jazz old offense. Mm. Chandler. Lou, you want to follow up? Um <laughs> Darius, when you went to Portland, then you had your career high. You had 47 points. And that was coming off the bench against the Nuggets and Carmelo Anthony. What was that like? Was there extra juice there going against Melo? You just get high. How, how do you do that? How do you have 47 off the bench? Uh, it was just one of them nights. Uh, I had a good night before. You know, Lou might know something <laughs> about that. I had a good night before in Denver. And, uh, yeah, it was just one of them nights. I just felt good. Uh <laughs> It organically just happened, and uh, I was just on fire. Uh, it still, it was, it was another team that was, you know, trying to rebuild and trying to find a place. Uh, they didn't got rid of she, and we got rid of a lot of players uh, to be a contender again. But uh, that night just felt good. It really didn't matter whether it was Melo or anybody else. Uh, I just, it was just a good night for me. 47 off the bench. All right, we're in the final stretch here, Darius. Uh, are there any teams right now, East, West, both, that in your mind stand out as they will be in the finals. They have a real shot. Uh, you know, I, I got a, my guy, Jason Tatum, mm -hmm. you know, St. Louis boy. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking those Celtics is, is really standing out for me to be in the finals. Uh, I'm rooting for the Clippers in the, in the west side to, to go. <laughs> That's about it. No, I, the lose too. I, the Kawhi thing last night was was a tough one. I'm, I got to ask you this because it'll settle the argument once and for all on this show, guys. Whatever he says goes. Who do you have as rookie of the year? Ooh. Mm. Uh, I got I got Big Wimby. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's an I, argument because Chandler won't do it. <laughs> Well, yeah, listen, yeah. His, his, rookie, his rookie year is insane. It's unbelievable. And I feel like we're literally talking about the rookie with similar stats on the worst team in the West with similar stats on the best team in the West. So I, I, does winning matter when you vote for this stuff? Maybe and uh, MVP, it, it does. For you know, All-Star, it does. So now Rookie of the Year, it doesn't. It's an individual award, you know. Uh, yeah, I think Wimby is... Man, it's just crazy, like, what he's capable of doing. And like I say, this is just his fill-out year. <laughs> like, it's going to be great. He, yeah. he could possibly win Defensive Player of the Year and Rookie of the Year. So it's, it's, it's getting ugly. My only problem, though, D, my only issue is we pick and choose who gets the, gets the, 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 the privilege of saying it's an individual award. Like, some guys are going to get judged based on wins and losses. And then you have guys like a Wimby who's in dead last, but the stats are so good, it's like, shit, it's, a, it's an individual war. That's where my beef come in. Like, if I'm Chet and I'm averaging close to 18 points a game and I'm basically 
you know, on a lot of given nights, the second or third best player on that team. It ain't like I'm just a shoe in or I'm just a throw in on that team. And I'm, I've been flirting with from being on the team from one to three, uh, one, two, and three spots all season. Like I would feel some way about that. You, you're definitely right. You, you, you should. But uh, we watched LeBron win the rookie of the year over Carmelo, and Carmelo made the playoffs the first year, and he led his team to the playoffs. You know, sometimes uh, shit true. happens. Case closed. Case closed. Jerry Smiles, my favorite guest we've ever had on the show. Uh, thank you for finalizing this argument once and for all. And I appreciate the answer. Uh, we appreciate the time as well, Darius. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate we will be you right back. Thank you. Yes, sir. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Around the league we go. Yeah, they lost to Houston, but that doesn't mean we can't show you this. Hooey! Go, go, gadget arms! This, <laughs> what do we think here? <laughs> this is like something I would do against my little nephew on like a Nerf hoop. Yes, that's what it feels like. Like, it doesn't feel like he's supposed to be on that floor with those guys right now. It's like he doesn't even touch it with his other hand. He doesn't even gather. He just, It looks like he's doing like a swoopy finger roll and the man dunks the ball from damn near outside the paint he barely has to jump like that's insanity to me i will say we're making like this like weird beef in the rookie of the year the dude is unbelievable like i can't wait until he like 20 30 pounds this guy is gonna be insane i wonder how much he's put on like i know they said between when he got drafted and then he got um Oh, who's playing tricks with us? Are you doing magic tricks? What's going on? He, he, they said he put on 20 or 19 pounds, but I ain't seeing it. Okay, let's don't move so we can go on to the next story. Knicks defense. Yes, they, uh, they are playing it. They are playing it very, very well. <laughs> First team in 12 years to hold opponents under 83 straight games. And obviously it's a Tibbs coach team. Why wouldn't it be? Uh, okay. They got OG Ananobi back last night, and it was a completely different outcome than playing the Sixers over the weekend. Is this defense enough to do something, Lou? I mean, is this I, – I know we looked at the East and we got Boston moving on, yada, yada. But it's kind of special what they're doing, no? Or is it just me being a homer because I'm here right now? It, it, it could be viewed as that. I'm going to tiptoe around this because I got a lot of love in New York, and I don't want to upset the, the Knicks faithful, uh -huh. but, you know, shit, they hadn't scored 100 points either in two out of three of those games. And so if you're not going to be able to score the basketball, it is a good thing for you to be able to hang your hat on being able to stop teams. You know, these, this is one of those things where, where coaches tell you, you know, on the nights that we're struggling on the offensive end, we just got to get stops and give ourselves the opportunity to win the game. The Knicks have been doing that. You know, I, I would like to see them put 115, 120 on the, on the mm. board because they, they like to play a little fast with some tempo. I think that's when Jalen Brunson is at his best, when he's in that open court, when he's able to chop defenses down before they're able to set up their defenses. But they've been able to do this three straight games. It's something that they could be proud of, but they also got to get their offensive game going again as well. Yeah, I mean, listen, three straight games, I don't care who it's against. It's It's... It's impressive, and you can chalk it up to a bad shooting night here and there. That's for one quarter or one half, three straight games. That's that's a pretty big sample size to keep under 80 points, especially all we talk about all year long is how good guys are offensively, how much talent there is, how fast they play. So this is impressive, and this is a classic Tibbs defense where he's got this DNA. He's created this culture where it's defensive and his practices, and there are stories how in his shoot arounds you get your ankles taped like this dude does not play and and <laughs> it's paid off the last three games and they do have guys like josh hart and the, that that fit his his system perfectly um and now that they're getting og back and they're they're winning these games without their offensive firepower without og without julius randall uh it's impressive and do they have enough i i don't think so but me and Lou always talk about the playoffs. It slows down half court. If they're locking in like this and they're taking out transition, it's going to make for a fun series, whoever they play. Let me, Not that fun to watch, let, though, if they're holding them under me, 80. Me, I mean, I think it's fun to watch. Yeah, Go ahead, Lou. that's what I wanted to ask you, Chandler. I want to play I want to play yin to yang. You know, they've done – this is impressive on a defensive end, but one of those games, 79 points, and another one, 90 points. Is that – that's not a concern for you come playoff time either? It is, and because they have to score the basketball, like you said, too. And again, they have that that roster and that that team to kind of bog it down and slow it down to play physical. 
I mean, they have guys that play a lot of minutes that, that, that just know their role. So it is, I think you can get by a few games. And by the way, their next game tomorrow night's at Portland. So they might, they might do it again for a fourth straight. They might do uh, four. <laughs> Dang. They might do it again, but uh, listen. I think, again, defense to me is 90% effort. And it seems like they have this collection of players that at least are buying into that, knowing their offensive, you know, game is maybe not as elite as the Bucks or the Celtics. So I think they're hanging their hat on this. When they're setting records like this, too, that really gives them, you know, motivation and momentum to continue to do it and continue to, to lock up. And they're going to get healthier and healthier. All right, quick break. Come back. A little more a run it back on a Wednesday. They're running back, running back, run it up, running back. Oh, how I've missed fit or brick. Let's get this bad boy started. Oh. <laughs> and you know what? He's out for the rest of the season, so we just we just get to keep seeing fits on fits on bricks. Look, I'm looking at the three of us. Are we fashionistas today? No. But that's something. That is something. That looks I'm like sorry, a little kid I'm sorry. This is not dope. This is not dope. It's campy. What about one piece or the other piece? Maybe the top only? It might no. be too much dope. That's what it looked uh, like. The bottom of okay. maybe a t-shirt. That's too much dope. This. Oh, oh. oh. Mm-hmm. Russell Westbrook. He Is this from the, because uh, he went to the Oscars after party. This okay, is yeah, a, this is Oscars after party. This is on brand, though. So, like, I don't really be tripping with Russell because this is on brand. This is, this I love is who him. he is at this point. Yeah, Russ has swag to pull this off now. He can do whatever Zingu. he wants. I know he's cold, though. <laughs> no, it was in L.A. It's uh, It was at the Oscars thing. Big time. All right. Um, that's not Jeremy Grant. Get out of here, font. All right, moving on to the next one. Are we moving on to the next one? Oh my God, it's broken. Well, good. We'll just talk about Russell. Oh, that's Jeremy Grant. That is Jeremy Grant. He looks like he's cosplaying some sort of. He looks like, like a. He looks like a black pilgrim. That's <laughs> what I was gonna think. That's what I was thinking. A pilgrim. Thank you. Also, why is he standing like a mannequin outside the store? Loose it up. And what is the store? Any? Where is hey. he? <laughs> Okay, that looks comfortable. I would wear this, obviously. I, 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 I this like it. Nice. He, I like it. He, he looks like he's. He looked like he on the yard, getting big, doing push-ups. I like it. Okay, that's not. That's not what we were saying. That's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what I'm saying. This is. This is Finally, uh, outfit we I liked, mean, Halliburton. There you I go. I will say this. That coat is big. That jacket's huge. Yeah, are his shoulders that brolic, or is no. there some pads? There's a pad situation under there. There's some styling going on. Are those leather? Merry or Christmas. Just shiny? I don't Merry mind Christmas. this, PJ. I like this. This move right here. I okay. sweat too much. Okay. Right. I'm going to do I'm these rolling every with single day. All right, that's going to do it for us. We will be back manana. Enjoy your Wednesday.